Thank you very much. I have to say that was um, the last time that uh, Professor Edel and I were together. We were having this conversation over dumplings. Um, and it is fun to look out here uh, in a very beautiful place and see some familiar faces here. Um, and uh, I have to say, Charlie mentioned the fact that I embedded with a, uh, with a Chinese tour group. And it is true, you know, I had spent some time working in Iraq and I was embedded with Marines in Anbar province. But um, embedding with a Chinese tour group in Europe, I, I wondered what might be a more hazardous assignment. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, fortunately, it turned out to be a wonderful, wonderful experience, and they were incredibly welcoming. And if anybody's interested, I'll be happy to talk about that and what I learned about their sense of emerging into the world through that. Um, today, I'm going to talk about this period that I've come to call the Age of Ambition. And um, just to give you a sense of, uh, before I get going here, actually, what I want to do is uh, First, I want to set this timer so that I don't uh, put you all to sleep. Um, it helps to understand a little bit about what it feels like to write in China, which on some level is our subject here, uh, is our subject here today. And there was a line from one of the great China scholars in the United States, John King Fairbank, who said once that China is a journalist's dream and a statistician's nightmare because he said it has more human drama and fewer verifiable facts than anywhere else in the world. And he said that in 1947. And in some ways, um, things have actually gotten better in terms of being able to understand what's going on on the ground, being able to verify what's going on on the ground. We're able to get around the country more easily because of transportation, because of technology, but at the same time, there are new ways of obfuscating. There are new ways that facts can be obscured. Uh, and it's become, in its own way, also a new, uh, a new and challenging period to try to get our arms around what's happening in China. Most of all, though, of course, we have many more questions of China. What, is its, what are its intentions in the world? What are the fundamental contradictions? And how important are they? And ultimately, what do they mean for us here in the United States? I want to read one paragraph uh, from the beginning of my book, because I think it sets the frame for our discussion and, and the way that I look at the country. Whenever a new idea sweeps across China, a new fashion, a philosophy, a way of life, the Chinese describe it as a fever. In the first years after the country opened to the world, people contracted Western business suit fever and Jean-Paul Sartre fever, and private telephone fever. It was difficult to predict when or where a fever would ignite or what it would leave behind. In the village of Xiajia, population 1,564, there was a fever for the American cop show, Hunter, better known in China as expert detective Hung Tu. When the show appeared on Chinese television in 1990, the villagers of Xia Jia started to gather to watch Detective Rick Hunter of the Los Angeles Police Department go undercover with his partner, Detective Dee Dee McCall. And the villagers of Xia Jia came to expect that Detective Rick Hunter would always find at least two occasions to utter his trademark phrase, works for me, though in Chinese he came across as a religious man, because works for me was mistranslated as whatever God wants. The fever passed from one person to the next, and it affected each in a different way. Some months later, when the police in Xia Jia tried to search the home of a local farmer, he told them to come back when they had a warrant, a word <laughs> that he had learned from expert detective Hung Tu. So why do I begin a discussion of contemporary China with a single village 25 years ago? Because for me, it's really about a way of seeing the place, a way of looking at it, and a way of deciding what matters. I tend to focus on the intimate, the perceptual changes in people's lives, the things that, frankly, don't often generate a lot of headlines, but are absolutely essential if you want to understand the things that people care about most of all. And I call this period, this period that I'm describing the age of ambition for two very specific reasons. I'm, just, I'm referring to something 
uh, uh, to something very specific. One is the collective national ambition, which is the thing in some ways that is easiest, I think, easiest for us to see from far away. It's the collective ambition to want to return China to a more glorious place in the world, the place that it, after all, had for most of human history. The other kind of ambition is the force of 1.4 billion people with each in their own way a different kind of aspiration. It's defined by their own idiosyncratic combination of tastes and risk taking and desire. And in many ways, uh, this is a kind of aspiration that was impossible until the last generation. And it's having a powerful effect on the country. And I think if you begin to understand those kinds of ambitions and what they are doing to China, it helps us understand some of the choices that the country makes and also the tensions that those are creating both inside China and then also in its relationship with the rest of the world. Our discussion uh, today is actually more timely than I think we even knew it would be when we came up with this idea some months ago. And that's because of what's been happening in Hong Kong. And let's see if we can make this happen. So the city of Hong Kong, as you know, in the last two months has been in the midst of a rare moment of political unrest. Protesters in September came out. They blocked roads. They surrounded government buildings. They brought this business-friendly city of 7 million people to a halt. What they were calling for was for Beijing to loosen its grip fundamentally on Hong Kong's political affairs. The police responded in some cases with pepper spray, tear gas, but the protesters remained. In fact, when there was this moment of escalation from the police side, it drew more people into the streets, not, not less. This week, the Hong Kong government's taken its first moves to clear Hong Kong to clear the streets. The protesters have, for the moment, allowed that to happen. They've sort of decided to declare a, 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 some kind of victory in the, on, this, on this stage of it. I think it's reasonable to expect that the underlying issues still endure. We haven't seen the end of this. Uh, but the impact of the last few weeks has been notable, because what it has shown us is that this is the first major act of civil disobedience in Hong Kong since the former, uh, I should say the largest act rather than the first, the largest act of civil disobedience since the former British colony returned to Chinese control in 1997. A lot of these events caught people by surprise. Those of us in the China watching community did not, uh, I think uh, with the, a few exceptions, did not expect that Hong Kong would become this uh, hotbed of unrest. And the question is why? Why did this happen? Why did we miss it? Why did it happen? And ultimately, what does it tell us about not just the future of Hong Kong, but really the future of, of China more generally? I think it is worth saying at the outset that Hong Kong and China are not exactly the same thing. What happens in a city of 7 million people is not the same as what happens in a country of 1.4 billion. They have different political histories. They have different economic profiles. But Hong Kong has always been a window into China, into its social, political, and economic dynamics. And if we want to understand what is going on in China, it makes sense for us to understand what is going in Hong Kong. Um, I think it will help us point ourselves towards the future and what will be some of the defining elements in the years ahead. When we talk about China today, let's remind ourselves where it's coming from, the path that it has followed over the last generation. 20 years ago, uh, it was actually this year, 20 years ago, uh, 1994, I went into a class on contemporary China. I was an undergrad at Harvard, had no background in the place, um, and was electrified by it. I mean, it was just this incredible drama of revolution and civil war and the rise of Chairman Mao, after all. All of it packed in to the last 60 years, and then... Um, after Chairman Mao and who led China in many ways, though he was able to improve some elements, literacy, public health, in the end, his period was a period of such economic dysfunction and political turmoil that by the end of his, his tenure, uh, China had a lower per capita income than North Korea. Uh, China, by the end of the late 1970s, had a per capita income roughly one-third the level in sub-Saharan Africa. And that created the opportunity for the rise of Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping led China out of seclusion back into the world. And then, of course, just five years before when I got interested in China, five years earlier, 
we'd had the democracy demonstrations in Tiananmen Square. Now, though those demonstrations are known best in the West for having ended in tragedy, having ended in bloodshed, and uh, that was in June of 1989. I think, like a lot of people, I was fascinated by what was happening in Tiananmen Square, partly because these were people who were barely older than I was, but also because what you saw was this very clear and visible contradiction. This was a country that was trying to come to terms with what it meant to be both Chinese and at home in the world. You saw these young people who would, they had, in some cases, they would hold up placards that had the words of Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. But then when it was time for them to deliver their demands to the party, they did it in the traditional style, down on their knees, in a formal petition, and they gave it to these uh, older party members who were still buttoned up in their Mao suits in some cases. And what you saw was a country in, in clear view of the world trying to figure out how they would, uh, how they would live as, um, as a more modern place. And what they also were was at the, at the very beginning of a much more demanding era. This was a period in which peop Chinese young people particularly had not grown up with the kind of deprivation that their parents had gone through. And they were expecting much more of the state. They were expecting much more of society. They had higher aspirations for themselves. There was a, a comment that a student protester said to a journalist during that period, which stayed with me. He said, I don't know exactly what we want, but we want more of it. And in a sense, that was the defining ethic of the time. That was the dominant mood in the air. I flew to Beijing in 1996 to start studying Chinese. It was a very different place, obviously, than it is today. Uh, Chinese economy back then was smaller than the Italian economy. More than that, up close, the city was not really what I had expected it to be from television cameras. I had this image of a place um, that was, in any event, uh, th what I came to, with a city that I sort of found when I got there was much closer in, certainly in geography and in spirit, really, to, to Mongolia than to Hong Kong. You know, China in 1996, Beijing in 1996 was still a place that was uh, it's, you know, if you went to Beijing, and I think there are people in this room who were there, uh, it smelled like coal and steel and, and garlic, and, uh, and I loved it, frankly. I absolutely loved the sense of this country that was just unfolding itself, and you were beginning to see what was going to be possible. Just to put it in perspective, in 96, this was where you went. The Jenghua Hotel was where you went when you really wanted a night out, when you wanted to just cut loose. You'd go and you'd get a hamburger at the Jenghua Hotel. And the architect later described it, very proudly uh, described it, as a perfect replica of a Holiday Inn that he had seen in Palo Alto, California. Um, today, the Jenghua Hotel looks like a guard shack. You know, Beijing today is, I should say, China generally is home to about 30% of the skyscrapers under construction in the world. In the last two decades, China's story has been defined above all by growth. I mean, the Chinese people today no longer want for food. In various you know, sort of basic terms, your average Chinese citizen eats about six times as much meat as he or she did in 1976. But this is also a ravenous period of a different kind in the way that people are now seeking out new ideas. They want respect in a way that uh, was difficult for them to demand before. They want new sensations. That's what leads them to Europe and allows a Western journalist to tag along. Um, China is the world's largest consumer of, you can go down the list, uh, beer, platinum, um, Louis Vuitton. Um, they recently surpassed the French in the consumption of red wine, which sent the French into a tailspin. Um, for most of the Chinese people, the boom years has not created vast fortune. It has allowed people to take the very first steps out of poverty. Um, in 1978, your average person made about $200 a year. Today, they make about $6,000 a year. But this has created a vast gap in uh, income, as you know. Uh, but to put it in very specific terms, the difference between China's poorest places and its, and its richest places today is the difference between Ghana and New York City. And this is a very acute sensation in a country that is, after all, ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. It's the People's Republic of China. And that is a, a kind of daily contradiction that is very hard for people to overlook. So what are China's national ambitions? What is it that this country really aspires to in the world today? And who are the people that are leading the country? What do they want? Well, the current generation came to power in November 2012. I was living in Beijing. <coughs> and I got an uh, invitation to go to the Great Hall of the People. 
and to see the unveiling of the new standing committee of the Politburo. Um, up until that moment, nobody in China knows who's going to be running the country for the next five years. Basically, the top two guys run it for 10, the rest of them run it for five, and then there's a new, uh, a new transition to power. Um, and then they come out on stage, always in exactly the same arrangement. It's always in front of the, the same uh, painting of the great, of the great, of the, uh, the great wall. And you'll notice, by the way, there's a couple things that always strike me about this photo. They wear virtually identical dark suits, identical red ties with the exception of one who is wearing a blue tie. And I'm happy to talk about that if anybody's interested when we get to Q&A. To those who are watching this at home, the message is very clear. This had been a season of political turmoil. You'll remember there had been a major Chinese figure who had been arrested for corruption, Boy Si Lai, and the message here was we have pulled together as one. Things are quiet, they're placid, we have a, a, a central, we have a, a consensus view of what it is, not consensus leadership necessarily, but we have a consensus view of the kind of China we're trying to promote and there are no internal divisions. That's what they wanted people to feel. President Xi Jinping, he's the fourth one from the left, steps forward to give his first remarks to the nation and what he said was actually quite striking. Uh, what he said was that he was dedicating himself above all to what he called the great renewal of the Chinese nation. And over the weeks that followed that concept of the great renewal of the Chinese nation became the central animating idea of his new administration. He turned it into a slogan, the Chinese dream. All of a sudden the Chinese dream is on television advertisements, bus shelters, it was on the front page of the People's Daily 24 times in the first couple of weeks. So what does the Chinese dream refer to? Um, well, to Chinese listeners it carries both domestic and an international component and they're both important for us. Part of this is about continuing and reinvigorating China's developmental progress. China's building, as you know, more airports, high-speed rail than the rest of the world combined. Last year it landed a spacecraft on the moon. It's considering a mission to Mars. It's another mission to the deepest reaches of the ocean. China today loans more money to the developing world than does the World Bank. And in some sense, the Chinese dream is about continuing that possibility of China assuming a greater leadership role in the world. But it's also about something deeper. It's also about unity. It's about a, it, the Chinese dream is a call on people to pull together under the leadership of the Communist Party and to reinvigorate this objective, which is, after all, to return China to the status that it once enjoyed. You know, this is the China that people have of their own image of their history. This is a civilization that was so advanced that it was printing books 400 years before Gutenberg. This is a country, after all, that controlled one-third of the world's wealth as recently as the 18th century. But as this grows and as China returns to this sense of its, of its own natural place in the world, that's putting new pressures on its relationship with other countries. For years, Chinese leaders believed that the best way for the country to conduct its foreign affairs was under a principle that Deng Xiaoping called hide your strength and bide your time, which meant, in effect, gradually return to the family of nations without upsetting uh, what was one of the only superpowers. What he really was talking about was not upsetting the United States. But a country that is on the path towards a great renewal, a country that is pursuing the Chinese dream, is less comfortable hiding its strength and biding its time than it used to be. And you've seen that in recent years China has staked out a more expansive role in its dealings with other countries. It has ver pursued very vigorously its territorial claims in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, there are people here who can tell us a lot more about that than I can. Um, they've done this in the face of opposition from Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and we're going to see a lot more of that in the years ahead. How far does this global ambition extend? I think this is one of the questions a lot of us have on some underlying level. Do the Chinese today see themselves as supplanting the United States as the leading power in the world? I think for Americans it's easy to feel that way, particularly when you live, as I do, in Washington, D.C., and you see the kind of political paralysis that we're confronting, the sense of our economy still struggling its way out of recession. Uh, I think there are also reasons to believe that for all of the tensions that we do see, uh, 
China today may not be as prepared as we might imagine uh, to want to catapult itself into the leading position in the world. And that's partly because they recognize that being the preeminent power comes with significant costs associated with it. The costs of global peacekeeping, for instance. I was in, uh, I was going to say also responding to crises uh, like, like the Ebola crisis. I was in West Africa 22 days ago, in fact. Um, and uh, it is something to see uh, when I was in Liberia and I flew up with uh, we went on a couple of Ospreys up to like northern Liberia to see what the United States was able to stand up over the course of a few weeks. And it is an awesome potential that we have. And the Chinese at that point, there was a Chinese cargo flight that had just landed on the runway. And uh, I was running around like a chicken with his head cut off trying to get the photograph of the Osprey and the Chinese cargo plane just perfectly to get the metaphor just right. But it was a really amazing thing to see. We are able to do things as a country that the Chinese would, would tell you they're not yet capable of doing. Um, and, uh, and they know that. Um, one little telling detail I've always thought is kind of a useful thing to remember. Recently, you may have seen some of these reports that the Chinese economy by one measure is now larger than that of the United States on the basis of purchasing power. Um, you would have thought that a country that is on the path of a great renewal, the Chinese dream, would put this on the front page, they'd trumpet this news. But when it first came out, actually, the instructions from the Central Propaganda Department were to bury it. Put it inside the paper. Don't put it on the front page. And that's because the Chinese, in a sense, they know that when you announce yourself as being the world's leading power and you, and you own that distinction economically, that it will come with a lot of uh, a lot of unanticipated consequences. So I think rather than see the Chinese as putting themselves immediately ahead of the United States in the world, they see themselves as a rising power, a return to a great power uh, in a multipolar world, but not in the end uh, catapulting past the United States overnight. So if we know now a sense of what it is that China wants on this national level, what are, the, what are the national ambitions? I think the question we should be asking is whether the Chinese people share the same dream with their leadership. What is it that Chinese people on an individual level actually want out of life? To answer that, uh, we have to understand what is this enormous force, this enormous sense of energy and possibility and also, I think, tension. Uh, and that is the awakening of aspiration over the course of the last generation. It's useful to remember when I'm talking about individual aspiration in China, this is a subject that frankly didn't deserve a whole lot of attention until recently. Historically, in China, the individual was not the dominant unit of measure. It was really about how that person was situated within these broader forces of the family, the village, the military unit, the factory, everything. You were always understood. You were the sibling. You were the, uh, you were, uh, your role in the village was very clearly defined. People's lives were always understood to be situated that way. You actually saw it in politics, in society. You saw it in the art, even. And this is a useful way to visualize it. This is one of China's most famous classical paintings. This is from the 11th century. It's by an artist named Fan Quan. It's called Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. And if you look at this, it's, of course, it's impossible to do it justice. But the only human being in here is right here. It's a horse driver who is pushing a, a mule train through the through the mountains and the image was was very was as clear to the viewers in the 11th century as that picture of the standing committee was that we saw a minute ago that's where the individual figured into the cosmos that's how much you mattered you were always understood to be part of this broader system and then you compare that to arguably the most famous classical picture in the west a full frame portrait the art, you know this is probably the first selfie uh, and it was a fundamentally different conception of where the individual figured into the world. And you saw this on the level of the law as well. In China, uh, in imperial China, if you were accused of a crime, for instance, it wasn't just the defendant who could be put on trial. It was also community leaders, neighbors, family members, people who were un understood to be, uh, in a sense, inseparable from the person who was accused. When it came time for punishment, same thing. Punishment was collective in many cases. People would also be held responsible for, those, for the crimes of those who were close to them. Historically, even the word ambition, the word that attaches, that I put so much emphasis on, had a very negative connotation. Uh, 
Uh, the word, one of the ways you say ambition in Chinese is ye xin, which is a wild heart, literally a wild heart. And if you were said to have a wild heart, that was a very negative thing. It was a pejorative. Uh, it meant that you put yourself in front of others. It was a kind of wolfish ambition. There's a collection of advice to rulers, an ancient collection of advice called the Huainanzi. And the Huainanzi includes the following warning. It said, keep power out of the hands of the ambitious, just as you would keep sharp tools out of the hands of the foolish. I live in Washington, D.C., and I've thought of this once or twice, I have to admit. Uh, that principle extended beyond Imperial China into the heyday of socialism. It was a kind of congenial uh, concept to carry over under Chairman Mao when, after all, the dominant fact of life was the pressure to conform. You know, the dominant fact of life was to pull together for collective sacrifices and gains. The state newspapers under, uh, in the sort of heyday of socialism, the state newspapers used to remind people that their highest calling was to be, as they put it, a rustless screw in the revolutionary machine. The pressure to conform reached its most intense manifestation during the Cultural Revolution. That was when any deviation from orthodoxy was dangerous. That would put you and your family at great risk. There was a physician who suffered terribly uh, during the Cultural Revolution. He was sent out to the far western reaches of the desert. His wife committed suicide. And the great uh, anthropologist Arthur Kleinman later asked him, he said, what did you learn from this experience? What did you learn about what it means to be Chinese as a result of your experience? And the physician said this. He said, to survive in China, you must reveal nothing to others or it can be used against you. Let your public self be like rice in a dinner, bland and inconspicuous. I have to tell you though, in the China that I have lived in for the last decade, that framework is less and less helpful for understanding what's going on there. And if we're going to truly understand what's happening, we have to be able to look uh, in a new direction and understand exactly how people are changing their conception of themselves. The change began at a lot of moments, but if we're going to identify one of them, it would obviously be 1978, the moment when Deng Xiaoping began to bring China back into the world by a series of free market reforms. They made the sort of fateful decision to open China to the world and Year by year, as they began to unravel the collective farms and the, and the factories, all of a sudden people had to make a lot more decisions in their lives. They had to decide, for instance, where it was they were going to live, where it was they were going to work, um, what it was that they wanted to do with their lives. There were limits on all of these things. There were household registration, which was a way that would control where people could go. They could live in the countryside or they could live in a city, but it was very hard to go back and forth. But the effect was so profound for the people who were caught up in this that one of the words that they used in Chinese to describe the feeling of leaving those collective farms and factories was songbang. In Chinese, songbang means to unfetter. And it's the unfettering that you usually use to refer to a prisoner or an animal. That's how profound it was, the economic change and the personal change in people's lives. When the free market reforms began, just to put it in perspective, in 1979, 80% of the Chinese population worked on a farm. By 1994, that figure had dropped below 50%. And by 2009, so basically the 30th anniversary of the reforms, about 200 million people had left their farms to move to the cities, the largest migration in human history. And as they were songbang, they began to do all kinds of things they hadn't been able to do before. They began to moonlight. You saw a, a, biz, a boom in the business of uh, printing business cards. Nobody needed business cards before because you didn't really need to announce who you were. All of a sudden, business cards were a great business. The newspapers, they stopped telling people to be a rustless screw in the revolutionary machine. There was a uh, state paper that carried the following headline, which I put aside, which was, you must rely on yourself, blaze your own path, and fight. And you began to hear this turning up in the language in all kinds of very interesting ways. Even the old word for ambition, ye xin, wild heart, gradually began to lose its negative connotation. It became a kind of neutral word. And then it sort of gradually began edging into positive territory. And if you go on to Amazon.cn today, you'll find books like this, which is How to Arouse a Wild Heart in Your Child. There's also on there How to Have a Wild Heart in Your Twenties. Um, the parenting section is full of things about wild hearts. Advertisers picked up on this concept, and they began to talk about m me and my, the China Mobile, which is the big 
uh, mobile phone company, began selling phones to, particularly to young people, with the message, my turf, my decision. You might think this is a purely urban phenomenon. Oftentimes these things feel like, okay, this might be happening in the center of Beijing. Like a lot of things in China, it begins in the cities and it bleeds out into the countryside. If you go to a school uh, in a rural area in the Yangtze River Delta today, you'll see that the kids there begin every morning by reciting the following pledge. Ever since God created all things on earth, there has not been one person like me. My eyes and my ears, my brain and my soul, all are exceptional. Nobody speaks or behaves like me, no one before me, and no one will after me. I am the biggest miracle of nature. So in China today, what you're seeing is that people are asking themselves in one form or another, what do I want? What do I want, and what do I want for myself and for my country, and what am I going to do to get myself there? I'm going to give you an example of what this looks like up close and what it feels like to the people who are caught up in it. About 10 years ago, I got to know a graduate student named Gong Haiyan. She was born in the mid-70s, um, had a fairly typical sort of family story. She was born in uh, a rural area, born at the foot of a mountain in Hunan province. Her parents could not read or write. They farmed. And, uh, but, but Gong Haiyan was growing up in this period of, the first period of peace and prosperity in China in a long time. She got a great education. She went to Beijing, went to Shanghai, uh, got her graduate degree in Shanghai. And then at that point, her parents said, OK, now you've done that. Now it's time to come home and get married. You know, this is the way it has always been and the way it will always be. It'll be something like this. And she said, frankly, I don't really want to go back to the village and marry a, a nice guy that you'll find for me. It's worth mentioning that historically in China, the way that marriage worked was it wasn't really based fundamentally on desire. That wasn't the most important element. It was about matching up two families that made sense together. In Chinese, the expression is two families with doors of the same size. And that meant either the similar financial profiles or uh, political profiles, uh, similar background. And um, over the years, as people have gained control over their lives, they've become a lot less comfortable with these, some of the old-fashioned traditions. And the matchmakers are in retreat. So uh, I began collecting, because it was an interesting window into how people were living their lives, I began collecting these online personals ads that people would place in which they would essentially lay out what it was that they wanted out of life. And I want to read you a personals ad by a young woman named Lin Yu. That's not her. That's somebody from the internet. <laughs> Lin Yu is a graduate student in the city of Wuhan, and she's looking for a young man with the following qualities. No previous marriages, master's degree or more, not an only child, no smokers, no alcoholics, no gamblers, not from Wuhan, taller than 172 centimeters, ready for at least a year of dating before marriage, sporty, parents who are still together, annual salary over 50,000 yuan, age between 26 and 32, willing to guarantee eating four dinners at home each week, <laughs> track record of at least two ex-girlfriends, but no more than four, <laughs> no Virgos, no Capricorns. So if anybody's interested, talk to me afterwards. I'll put you in touch. Yeah, exactly. So Gong Haiyan, Gong Haiyan, who had grown up, after all, in a village and had gone to the city, knew that there were a lot of people like her in her position. A lot of people who had this sense that it was up to them to make this kind of choice. So she started a company. She started a company called Shi Ji Jia Yuan. In Chinese, uh, it means beautiful destiny. And it's basically the Chinese match.com. And it took off. When I met her, she was finishing graduate school. She lived in a little shoebox of an apartment. Um, she started the company. It became the most popular dating site in China. She took it public on the NASDAQ and made $77 million. And it all happened so fast, it all happened in the span of just about six or eight years, that she really didn't even have time to let her own sort of habits catch up with her life. She moved into an apartment in a villa in the suburbs of Beijing, a villa sort of like this. And I went to go visit her for dinner. And I noticed the first thing I saw when I walked in was that the family moped was right there in the front hall. And I said, why is it in, that's what you do in the village. And I said, why is it in the front hall? She says, well, I think it's just safer this way. I said, I think you're okay. Your next door neighbor is the Swiss ambassador. I don't think he's going to be taking it from you. <laughs> but, you know, she, uh, but it was her house. And uh, 
She didn't get there by being complacent. Um, there is nothing ordinary about somebody like Gong Haiyan. You know, she's an extraordinary person the way that entrepreneurs are in a lot of places. But in her story, I think we see the dynamics of something important. Very briefly, what we see is the onset of enormous economic op opportunity, if you can get it, the belief that you are entitled to something better, and the expectation of individual choice. As I've tracked the ambitions over China, of China over the last uh, over the last generation, the awakening of those ambitions, I've come to understand them really as occupying three pursuits. There's sort of three buckets of aspirations that are worth thinking about. The first is the pursuit of fortune. That's the one that's the obvious one for us here. We see that from far away. You see it when you're in China. You see it in the story of Gong Haiyan. What's interesting, though, is that as people like Gong Haiyan begin to acquire property, they get the villa, they get the car, they begin to have the things, the pursuit of fortune is satisfied for them in these small initial steps. What they discover is that the more that they acquire, the less comfortable they feel, the less secure they feel. All of a sudden they have things they need to protect. They realize in a sense that they need to know who is well, I'll put it this way. They need to know, for instance, it's not just about having the car, having the house. They also need to know, well, am I safe? I mean, are my kids safe? For instance, what's going on with the air in China? And they begin to ask those questions. You know, it's the kind of, you satisfy your basic material requirements, and then you begin to worry about other things. Chinese uh, citizens today can pick up their smartphones, and they can check the AQI, the air quality on any given day, they can see how it matches up to the World Health Organization's standards. And what's interesting about it is it's become a status symbol to know. It, because it implies that you care enough about yourself and that you're urbane enough, that you're thinking enough about, you're cosmopolitan enough to care about the air that you breathe. Um, you begin to wonder who is setting the rules in your society. And you begin to ask who is breaking the rules in your society and why are they able to break them. All of these are not political questions in their origin, but they have a political expression in a way. In effect, what's happening is that the Chinese middle class is discovering that the more they acquire, the less they can afford to be ill-informed. And this creates the second pursuit. The second pursuit that I, uh, that I think about is the pursuit of truth, in effect. It's the pursuit of information. It's the sudden awareness that they cannot afford not to have that information. If you look at surveys today in China, what you discover and it may be hard to read in the back, but what you see is that the Chinese population today cares less about crime or unemployment. What they care about is protecting the value of what they have. They're worried about the erosion of the things they've accumulated. So they worry about corrupt officials. They worry about the gap between rich and poor. They worry about air pollution. Finally, uh, the more that they begin to question these kinds of basic facts about their experience in society, they are also beginning to ask deeper questions, bigger questions, the sort of transcendental questions about what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a parent? You know, you have historically in China when Confucianism was an idea that made a lot of sense to people, that was very present in their lives, that helped you understand some of your roles as a citizen, as a, as a father, as a son. Uh, things have gotten uh, mixed up over the last generation. And so you see these days a pursuit of faith in a very visible way. Anybody who's been in China in the last 10 years probably has had the experience of a friend, a Chinese friend, saying, oh, you know, I've recently gotten interested in Buddhism or Taoism or Christianity. There are now roughly as many Christians in China as there are members of the Communist Party. This is a period of a, a kind of great awakening in China that is comparable to the great awakening that we saw in the United States at the end of our own, uh, of our own period of enormous growth, or in the midst of our own period, period of enormous growth. And I think as the Chinese people are sort of setting off to find what it is that excites them, what it is that they want to they want to place their faith in, they're beginning to answer those questions for themselves. They're less comfortable, in effect, being given a set of values, a set of priorities, and they're beginning to say, well, I'm going to choose for myself what I care about. And that is not a simple process, and it's not one that necessarily guarantees a very quiet, harmonious, domestic scene. I'm going to tell you briefly, and then I'll, I'll be happy to take questions and talk about whatever is on people's minds. I just want to tell you briefly about a guy who I came to know a couple of years ago, because he's kind of interesting. 
You remember in 2008, the year of the Olympics in Beijing, there was this outpouring of nationalism in China, particularly when the Olympic torch began making its way around the world and it encountered protests in a lot of cities. People took the torch as a, a reflection of the Chinese government. And in China, particularly young people, rose up in response. And there were these protests in front of Carrefour, the French uh, grocery store, and, and other places where people were saying they were, they were sort of rising up to defend China's image. And in the middle of this, there was a video that appeared on the Chinese web. It was a very angry video. It was called China Stand Up. And it was about the messages in this little short sort of YouTube clip, about five minutes long. It was about we must protect ourselves against efforts to encircle and contain China, that we are at the beginning of a new Cold War perpetrated by the West. And it shot up to the number two most popular video in China. And um, it was kind of an interesting and, and a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a rough period. I remember at the time I got a, Western journalists were often the target of a lot of this anger because they would say, well, you're not representing China fairly. And I got a fax on my machine at the office that said, correct your misunderstandings of China or you and your family will wish you were dead. And it was not, I don't think it was directed personally to me. A lot of reporters got it. But there was a level of anger there that was interesting to me and I wanted to understand it. So I said, well, let's figure out who made this video. And I uh, got in touch with the guy who had made the video. And I said, can I come see you? And he said, yeah, you can come down and see me. I'm in Shanghai. And before I went, I'm a little embarrassed in retrospect, but before I went, I sort of said, well, told people, look, if you don't hear from me a couple of days, I've gone very bravely down to Shanghai to <laughs> gather the news. Uh, I get to Shanghai, and the first thing that happens, I meet this guy, and he tries to pay my taxi fare. He was a graduate student at Fudan University studying Western political philosophy. His name is Tang Jie, and he speaks English and German. He was studying specifically, he was doing his dissertation on phenomenology and the work of Edmund Herschel. And he said, are you familiar with Herschel's work on phenomenology? I said, of course, I'm very familiar. Every American is very familiar <laughs> with Herschel's work. Um, and what I came to realize, for, I got to know Tang Jie, uh, and what's interesting about him is a couple of things. He and his cohort, and there were a lot of young guys like him, they were the winners, right? They had gotten to the great university. They were fortunate. They were born at a time in which they weren't, they weren't subject to famine. They weren't at war. They had very little deprivation in their lives. His, again, his parents couldn't read or write. He was the youngest of four siblings. Um, but he had grown up in a period in which China was all about every year was a little, the GDP was higher. Every year was a little bit more opportunity, a little bit more openness. And what he saw was this image that the West has of China that for him was so at odds with his image of China and it offended him. And in a sense, partly because he had grown up in this environment where he was learning about Western political philosophy, he almost had to be holier than thou and he had to reclaim his belief in China and had to reassert his, de redemonstrate in a way his devotion to the cause. And that's what led him to become in many ways uh, a true believer in a, and, and one of the primary spokesmen for a new conception of Chinese nationalism. And then there's an interesting coda to his story, which is that you remember I mentioned Boy Xilai, the Chinese official who was taken down in a, uh, uh, in a corruption investigation. Well, during that period in 2012, four years after I met him, there was a lot of pressure that came on different parts of Chinese civil society. The government just got very nervous and they wanted to sort of settle things down, get a closer, a, a tighter grip on, on what people were talking about, writing about, thinking about on the web. Tang Jie had been so successful in his video that he had built a business out of it. He'd uh, gotten uh, angel investors, attracted venture capital funding, and he'd started what he called the Chinese Nationalist YouTube which was uh, a site that was going to promote the ideas that he cared about. And it was popular. It was a good business. He rented a big, beautiful office up in Beijing right next to Baidu, which is the chart of Chinese Google. I mean, he had, a, he had a full operation. He had a staff. And then um, during this period in 2012, when they needed to, when the government got very nervous, they wanted to settle things down, they said, well, let's start looking out what's happening on the web. And over the years, Chinese, uh, as, as the Chinese sort of nationalist YouTube got a little bigger, Tang Jie got more settled into his job. He got a little more ambitious. And he began to say, well, we're not just going to criticize Western journalists. We're also going to identify and criticize 
Chinese officials who are not living up to the standards that the public have set for them and the highest standards of socialism and the party and the great tradition of Chairman Mao and we're going to call them out and we're going to criticize them. So they sort of had gradually drifted into this more expansive conception of their own capability. And so they had these essays on there that were attacking corruption. And somebody in the propaganda department somewhere said, looked at the Chinese Nationalist YouTube one day and said, what is going on with the Chinese Nationalist YouTube? And they shut it down. They, blo they blocked it. So all of a sudden, this guy who was the truest of true believers had found himself on the receiving end of censorship. And for him, that was, I think, in many ways, a reflection of the, f of the basic collision that we see in China today, which is the collision between the individual aspirations that have been awakened and that have been the greatest source of strength and energy over the last generation and the Chinese collective national ambition to try to maintain unity, to try to Im uh, impose and... and, and, and and maintain uh, this one central conception of what the state will be and what the country will be. And in that collision is where we see the origins ultimately of Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, you remember, this was started because the Chinese government said, we're going to help you figure out who it is that's going to run the country. Instead of having open nominations for your chief executive, we're going to identify a, a slate of reasonable candidates. We're going to have a committee that's going, to not, that's going to vet these candidates. And when they did that, people went into the streets. And they said, well, hold on. We want to have this open nomination process. And there were other things going on. There was, I think you could make a case that there was a pursuit of fortune, pursuit of truth, and pursuit of faith, too. Because if you talk to the young people in Hong Kong, they would tell you that one of the reasons they were in the streets was because they could not get that sense of material satisfaction they wanted. You know, real estate prices were too high. They couldn't afford to buy an apartment. Um, the income gap in, China, in Hong Kong has grown since it returned to Chinese control. And they blame, in many ways, the, what they would call interference from Beijing. It's about pursuit of truth, too, because if you ask people on the street in Hong Kong what it is that they want, they'll say, well, we don't want them to interfere in our newspapers. Chinese, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on Hong Kong newspaper editors to be less critical of the um, of what happens in Beijing and then finally it's about faith in a in an important way because what you really saw in Hong Kong fundamentally was a choice between two possible ethics to define China's future one is the nationalist ethic which we've talked about and the other one is the thing that is essential to Hong Kong which is the globalist ethic you know Hong Kong sees itself as China as, as Asia's original global city and what they were confronting was the possibility of being consumed within this very Chinese nationalist ethic. And they basically stood up and said, we won't do it. So I'll just leave it there and tell you that I think that what, what drove these events are also giving us a window into some of the motivations, I think the imperatives and the underlying dynamics that are going to be important in China in the years ahead. And I'll be looking forward to keeping track of them. Thank you very much for listening. Let you uh, fill the questions on your own until mm. I uh, ah. see you uh, fainting. Here, here. here. We'll off after a little while. Sure. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Lieutenant Commander Tsai. I'm from Taiwan. Mm. And, uh, before my question, I'd like to point out one thing about the, the Chinese painting you showed to us uh, the 11th century. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to tell everyone the painting is in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> said. Yeah. In the Palace Museum, or is it somewhere else? Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Great. I also bought you a book. It's a great one. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. My question is, uh, I think in your book and uh, also from your your speech, I you heard lots of contradiction between the uh, like uh, the parties, Chinese Communist Party, and the common people. The contradiction is, uh, I mean, the gap is getting wider and wider. Do you think the Taiwan? Because you didn't mention Taiwan, you know, I'm Chinese, so. Uh, mm hmm do you think Taiwan can be a more like a proactive role in this kind of keep a Chinese modern China, China or like a new direction to go? Because right now they, they I mean they, they tend to learn something from Western world, but uh, as Taiwan we are also ethnically identical with them. So yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm glad you mentioned Taiwan at the outset too. I think <coughs> this is such an interesting and complex moment in the mainland's relationship with Taiwan because in some ways it feels like it's getting better. And then, or at least getting less hostile, it feels this way to, from, from far away. 
And then you see what happens in Hong Kong. And I think to a lot of people in Taiwan, they said, we don't want to have anything to do with Maine. This, just, this, is a, this, was, this set back in many ways, I think, Beijing's attempt to try to build some relationship with Taiwan. Because I think people in Hong Kong really feared the idea that they would lose the kinds of liberties that are very important to people in Taiwan. I've had a lot of friends from the mainland who have gone to Taiwan for the first time, and they always come back with the same reaction, which is, wow. It is, for them, in a sense, it's a possibility of what China can be. Um, and then it, you know, it kind of comes up against also the education that they've received and the messages that they receive on a daily basis, which is what happens in Taiwan on an island of this size is impossible in China for 1.4 billion people. That's what the, so oftentimes they will say, I love it in Taiwan. You know, the food is safe. It's delicious. Uh, the air is clean. But it's impossible here. This is, I hear this over and over again. They say the same thing about New York City. Um, but what I think is interesting is that those kinds of received ideas about what it is and is not possible in China are, are a little bit more malleable. Some of these issues are beginning to be debated. There used to be no facility for debating these kinds of things. And now, even though the internet is very strictly controlled, there are still realms in which people can talk about things. Um, but I, you know, Taiwan still remains the most neuralgic issue for the Chinese leadership. And so in some ways, it's one of the hardest ones, it, particularly if you're a leader like Xi Jinping, who's trying to consolidate your authority, you have a very limited bandwidth in, a, in, order, I, in which you can operate with mobility. You have to be very conscious about, about reassuring people on your left flank, on your right flank, and they have to be very careful. So I think that constrains them a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. I haven't been actually on a daily oh, okay, basis. Yeah. I really liked your discussion of how the internet. Oh, mm. oh, sorry. I really liked your discussion of how the internet developed and is used in China. And here you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll restate the question too okay, in a second. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Well, even though you haven't been following it, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about what you think China's. So it seems like China's model of how the internet should be regulated is one that's going to try to market with the time, and it definitely is doing this conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is whether the Chinese conception of internet management, as it would be known in China, whether that is something that they will be able to sell around the world, and um, whether what are the chances that that'll become something that's more readily adopted in other countries. Um, two thoughts on that. It's not a subject I know a huge amount about on a technical basis. I can tell you, though, that internet culture as an idea is, is essential to everything, as you know, that everything I've been writing about and thinking about, because Without the internet, a lot of the dynamics we're talking about would not have come to the fore as, as quickly and I think as vividly as they have. Um, the Chinese censorship system is the most successful form of censorship, the largest, most expansive censorship system that the world has ever seen. It is also, in my view, utterly incapable of achieving the task for which it's designed. Um, because it is based on some level on the ability to, it's very difficult to scale, it's very difficult to respond to crises that pop up that they don't anticipate. Um, they've, there's a tendency in the China watching world you know, to either take one view or the other, to say, oh, they've been much more successful than we think, or to say it's doomed. I think in a funny way, it's very good, it's sort of both. It's able to work on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but it's brittle. And what happens is that when there is a crisis, they have to marshal their energy very fast, and it's, it can be hard to respond. I, you know, they've tried to sell it in other countries. They've succeeded in some places. But I was in uh, Burma. Uh, I was in Burma about 18 months ago, and I was spending a lot of time with Burmese officials and, and entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you one thing that came through in my conversations with them, you know, as they were sort of tacking towards the West again. They said, I, you know, I said to people, are you beginning to use Chinese servers, for instance, Chinese, um, uh, you know, an enterprise software? I was just trying to curious, are you putting your information in the cloud, in the Chinese cloud? And the answer I got was, would you put your information in the Chinese cloud? <laughs> and that was in Burma. And so I thought, now that's interesting. So um, I do think that they have a brand issue that they're working on. And that's a big, big uh, kind of reputational deficit that they have to make up. Yeah. I just wanted 
go back to your photo of the blue tie and the story behind that. <laughs> yeah. So the blue tie was the guy on the end, Wang Qishan. I think uh, folks here may recognize Wang Qishan. He is in charge of the anti-corruption drive, the Central Commission on Discipline and Inspection. Um, he is the Internal Affairs Department. He's the guy who is in charge of figuring out who's going to get um, who's going to get rolled up and who is uh, who's going to be taken down. And he's always been a bit of an independent thinker. Um, but I think this is not accidental because after that blue tie, in all of the official portraits of the um, of the leadership that went out over the next few weeks, he was always wearing a slightly different getup. So, for instance, if they were in sport coats, he was in a windbreaker. If they were in windbreakers, he was in a sport coat. And it was about separating him from the group and saying he is part of this, but he is not entirely of the leadership. He stands apart, which I think was actually very shrewd uh, for, for his purposes and also for Xi Jinping's purposes. Yeah. Can I ask actually a similar question? Um, I'm familiar with the, you know, the phrase, everything counts in large amounts, and I've seen tons of photos, and you had two of them in the presentation, where it's just a mass of humanity all dressed identically the same, and, and and when you juxtapose that against you know, the, the childhood book and, yeah. and the, the things that they say in the morning about I'm an individual and so forth, what do you think the nature of the conversation would be with the kid that said, I still want to go, but I want to wear a blue jumpsuit, or <laughs> I, I want to be an individual? It, where, where does that conversation It's a great question. Go? Actually, I'm glad you asked that. That's a really interesting dynamic. And I think what's going on is that people are, they allow these two ideas to coexist in their head at the same time. And it's imperfect, but. Um, in a sense, out of deference to your parents, you don't say, I want to wear the blue suit. I'll wear the red suit. It is partly still about validating you know, your conception of what it means to be Chinese. And this is partly, you know, in some sense, people don't acknowledge. I think what's interesting is that people don't always acknowledge this sudden awakening of individual uh, ethic. Oftentimes, when you first raise this in China, people say, oh, no, 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 it's not the case. And then you begin to sort of unspool the evidence. And they'll say, well, that's true. That's true, too. And I do have that book. Um, and I did put my online personals ad on. But it is so much a, cons a part of what it means to be Chinese, to be conscious of the collective, and to be thinking about others first, that people will, it's a cognitive dissonance, that we will try to avoid, in a sense, um, they will try to avoid actively rubbing up against that traditional sensibility if they can. And what happens is oftentimes, it's not when you voluntarily choose to put yourself out of step, out of sync with your peers. It's when your own desires and what it is that you're trying to accomplish forces you out of sync with your peers. You know, I've always, always thought that almost nobody in China chooses to be a dissident. And a dissident is the most extreme manifestation of what we're talking about. It's the person who puts themselves far out of the mainstream. The reason nobody chooses to be a dissident in China is because it's an incredibly dangerous and risky thing to do. You know, you're putting your entire life at risk, you're putting your family at risk, and so on and so on. And when you ask anybody in China, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of these guys over the years, and you say, well, no, you know, why did you become a dissident? I'm not a dissident. Oh, really? Well, you're under house arrest, and you've been fighting with the government for five years. <laughs> okay, well, but, and it's because it's so, you know, they don't want to perceive themselves as, as doing that. They really, uh, but it's also just a fact on the ground. So uh, forward looking, I would say that the, in, the rise of the individual ethic is a force that is not going to change in China. That is not going to be rolled back. It's an artifact of our time. It's a function of technology, the consumer experience, you know, go down the list of being a part of the global system, going to Europe, um, getting on a bus and traveling around Europe on your own. All of those kinds of things contribute to this. And it's really going to be about whether the Chinese institutions can adapt themselves. And this is the key thing. I think they're more adaptable than we often think they are. They will seek to adapt themselves to this change in Chinese, um, in, in, I think, Chinese worldview. But you cannot put that back in a bottle. Yeah? You, you kind of hinted at um, really a question of stability. Uh, in the article in the Diplomat today, likening the Hong Kong uh, issues to some of the other, um, not revolt, but uh, protests around the, the region, likening it to a, an Asian spring. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to your thoughts on the stability as it is and the personal ethic rises? Yeah, I think a couple of thoughts on stability. One is that there is a lot more domestic dissent and unrest than oftentimes people see from the outside. I think you know, anybody who's an area specialist knows that the Chinese government counted about 180,000 acts of unrest, mass uh, protests of one kind or another in the most recent accounting. That was 2012, I think. 
180,000 acts in a year. That's 500 every day. That's a lot. There's a lot going on. Most of them, with very few exceptions, are successfully pacified. And they're put down with a fairly reliable toolbox of police action and uh, education and um, force. And the reason why Hong Kong was, a, was problematic was you couldn't use any of those instruments. They didn't control the police the same way. They don't have the same education system. And they couldn't use force because it was too visible and, and, it's, and it's Hong Kong. <coughs> um, personally, I think that the chances of a, of a, of a broad-based act of, of organized unrest, um, it's hard to envision how it happens at the moment. Um, I used to live in Egypt. And in Egypt, it was a place that was desperately poor. And it really wasn't all that hard to imagine the tinderbox scenario. China's a different place. I mean, the people in uniform are well fed. They've got good material. They've got good uniforms. They're literally the people who will be called upon to intervene in the event of an act of political unrest are responsive. Um, I actually think that the, the chances of something happening in the next few years are fairly high because of all of the underlying conditions that are there, economic inequality, pollution, all of these kinds of things. Um, but I think one thing we've learned about predicting unrest in the United States is it's very hard to predict in other countries when it's going to happen. Would we have guessed it was going to be a fruit seller in Tunisia? No. Um, I think in China, if you were ranking the risks, you would probably say that an environmental crisis that contributes in some way to a broader metastasizing sense of, of uh, political unfairness and injustice, that's a conceivable scenario. I think that's one that we put pretty high on our list. Yep. <laughs> yeah. After that, just mention a couple of takeaways that you had about you know, it was a really wonderful trip, actually. I mean, it was, uh, I did this basically because um, a lot of my Chinese friends were beginning to travel, and they'd never really had the opportunity before. In Chinese history, generally, you, could, you would migrate. You know, you'd go to set up a, a town somewhere. You'd move to a Chinatown in another country. But to go overseas for leisure was just a kind of privilege people didn't have because it was expensive and, and everything else. Um, <coughs> and people began to travel uh, in large numbers. A couple of takeaways. One, uh, I was on a, I'll just tell you, the mechanics of the trip where it was 40 people, so it was 39 Chinese tourists and, and me, and we were on a bus for 10 days. Uh, 10 days, five countries. And we covered a lot of ground. I can tell you it is possible to be in Europe for 10 days and eat only Chinese food. Um, <laughs> and magnificent Chinese food, I should add, because it was kind of wonderful. You go to each one of these cities, and we'd be driving past these kind of gorgeous bistros and everything and we'd find this one restaurant and it was always delicious actually and it was very kind of anyway the people were incredibly welcoming they tended to be small town entrepreneurs teachers accountants I mean it was a fairly uh, sort of lower middle class uh, cohort and in almost every case it was their first trip out of Asia a couple of them had been elsewhere in Asia they'd been in Malaysia or Indonesia or Thailand um, the first thing they commented on and the thing they commented on over and over again was the quality of the clean air. This was a powerful fact, you know. And it was kind of interesting because our conception of Chinese priorities has always been economic development above all. And your average person would say, okay, I understand the air is bad, but we've, we've got to put the economy first because otherwise we will fall behind and we'll lose all these opportunities. I think you're getting a thicker conception of the good life in China today. People are starting to define satisfaction in other ways. That would be one. The other, other piece I would say is um, when we were deciding where to go and where to spend our time, we spent about 15 minutes at the home of Karl Marx, where he was born. We spent about two hours at Louis Vuitton <laughs> in Paris. Evan, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, right here. Um, my question is generally about civil mill relations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so first I wonder, in the age of ambition, how an individual's uh, trajectory accommodates military service. Mm. So what that means to the individual in an age of ambition, and then generally what public perceptions of its military are. That's a good question. I have a couple thoughts, and I wish I knew more on it. But I'll tell you a couple things that are notable. Um, you know, one of the f sort of artifacts of this internet age has been that there is a much greater awareness of corruption in the military. 
And that, I think, was something that people didn't really see. It was very hard to glimpse that historically. About a year and a half ago, a young woman went online with a lengthy essay about how she had paid the fee that she had been asked to pay, to pay by a recruiter in order to get into the military, and then was told at the last minute that somebody else had paid a larger fee and she was not going to get in. And it, what was interesting about that was 10 years ago she would have gone home and brooded about it. Today she went online immediately and complained about it. And it was a huge embarrassment and people lost their jobs and so on and so on. I was once on a flight on my way back from Macau. Sorry, these are anecdotal, but they're just, they tell you something about how this problem got so bad. I was on a flight on my way back from Macau and the guy seated next to me was kind of beautifully dressed. Anyway, he spent the whole time working on his new cell phone that he had bought. It was a $14,000 cell phone. And he was telling me about what he was doing. It had a, like it had a 24 hour concierge at the other end. And he was telling me that he was taking equestrian lessons and his son was, had a horse. And finally, after we'd been on this flight for 45 minutes, I said, sir, what do you do? What, what is your profession? And he said, oh, I'm career military. And I said, <laughs> wow. <laughs> And uh, so, um, you know, I do think that fundamentally the public perception of the military, the People's Liberation Army, is very positive. It's still a part of the essential founding narrative of the country. And they have uh, managed to maintain that sense that the military is a part of our lives. The big damage, of course, was 1989, when the military was, for the first time since the founding of the nation, turned on the public. And it did huge damage to its reputation. It was sort of, in its own way, limited because you had to be the kind of person who was ideologically open to the idea that what happened in 89 was a, that, that the crackdown in 89 was a bad thing. A lot of people in China accepted the conventional narrative, which was it was, a, it was a painful moment, but a necessary moment to continue the march of economic progress. For a certain stratum of society, thinking people, intellectuals of a certain kind, they believed it was a tragedy and, a, and, a, and a, an avoidable tragedy. And military, and you've probably heard this among, uh, you know, if you've spent time uh, among, with the Chinese officer corps, they were, they were hugely damaged as a result. And they felt that they did not want to have that happen again. And so there was a kind of a, 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 a new wariness um, about being called in to do the business of what the civilian leadership would want on the domestic side. We have never seen it really tested. We don't know exactly what would happen, but I don't think it was a coincidence that in Xi Jinping's first year in office, he made a lot of very visible visits to military installations to show that he was knowledgeable, that he was close, and that he had their support. Um, so he, he prioritizes that, I think, very highly. Um, at this point, uh, we can just thank Evan for a terrific uh, lead-off to this series, uh, but uh, you might be on the hook to come back as the